Well, thank you everyone for coming. Can I just take a quick photo? I realise that some people don't want to be in photos, so feel free to duck. Easy. It's just that my mum said no one would turn up to a talk about boilers, because why would they? Right, so if you don't mind, if you don't want to be in it, feel free to duck. Otherwise, let me just take a quick photo, and then we can get on with it. Perfect. Right then. Now for some caveats. I realise there's probably a en heating engineer or two in the tent, um, but this is the abridged version of the talk. It was originally over an hour because there's a lot of stuff to get through. So there's a whole bunch of stuff that's listed here which we won't be able to go through, but I'll be in the robot arms after the talk for a well-earned pint. Feel free to grab me or we can discuss things in more detail. Uh, and before we get going, let's talk about how a gas boiler actually works. It's a metal box, which you see on the wall, and water flows through the top half, and gas comes in the bottom half, and then it burns, and the water gets hot. Okay, I'm pointing out the obvious, but we've got to start somewhere. And the water flows around the pipes in your house through the radiators, and the radiators cool down, which warms up the room. This is a simplified version of it, there's no pumps or sensors or electronics here. Now, Martin Lewis talks about flow temperature a lot, but he never completely explains why. So that's why I'm here to explain. So flow temperature is basically just the temperature of the water as it leaves or it's flowing out of the boiler on the right on this picture and for extra info there's another thing called the return temperature which is just the temperature of the water it's returning into the boiler why this matters will become apparent in a few minutes but first one minute of o-level chemistry no no groaning only one minute this is what happens inside your gas boiler on the right there's a molecule of methane which is the expensive gas that we all buy and it needs two molecules of oxygen, which then gets converted into one molecule of carbon dioxide, which is causing all this nasty global warming, two water molecules, and an awful lot of heat. I'm coming to Martin Lewis in a second. Now, condensing boilers were invented to recover the heat that's in those two water molecules that are escaping normally just straight outside your house which then condense into a trickle of cool water as they give up the heat they contain. So I've added an air intake, so that's where air gets sucked into the boiler, and the exhaust, which is the flue that goes, goes out of your house, and you see the little vapour escaping in cold weather. That's the dots in this picture. And now the condensing part, what that actually does is it captures the heat out of that vapour as it's escaping and puts it back into the return water which heats it slightly so it saves gas. So you need less gas to heat. But there's a catch, isn't there always a catch? Due to the wonderfully named latent heat of condensation, in order to get that water vapour to condense back into water and give up its heat so it preheats the return water, the return water's got to be below 55 degrees Celsius, otherwise nothing happens. And that's where the condensation starts. To get maximum condensation, that return temperature needs to be an awful lot lower. So, there are only two ways you can do this, realistically. You either have much bigger radiators, these are the double and triple panel versions that you see in various shops, so that they can get more heat out of the water as it's going through the radiator, so the return water's cooler. Or you can turn down the flow temperature, that's the temperature of the water that's coming out of the boiler, so that by the time it does the lap of your house, it's cooler, because if it starts lower, it'll end lower. Now, bigger radiators are always better. There's no, no cutting it, no arguing bigger radiators, the bigger radiators you've got, the more radiators you've got, is always better. The problem is, what with prices of everything going up over the last few years, 
it's not a great solution. It's also quite expensive to get them fitted if you're not into plumbing. Unless, of course, you're replacing the radiator anyway. If you're replacing the radiator because the old one's rusty or you're doing work on the house or putting bathrooms in or whatever, always go for the biggest radiator you can fit in that position because every bigger radiator you fit makes your boiler more and more efficient. Or you could just turn down the flow temperature, but that has problems, which we'll come to in a minute. So the flow temperature control isn't this, these kind of things which you see here. These are room thermostats that say how hot you want the room. What you need is controls which are actually on the boiler itself, like this one here with the pink arrow, if you're lucky. If you're unlucky like me, you'll need a set of screwdrivers and some spanners and then start dismantling your boiler until you find the flow control, although most of them are easier to get to than mine. So to recap, lowering the flow temperature lowers the return temperature, leads to more condensation which preheats the water, which means you use less gas which saves you money and also the environment. But why, I hear you ask? Thank you very much, audience participation. If you're running a modern condensing boiler in non-condensing mode, which the vast majority of the ones I've played with are, you're using anything up to 50% more gas than you should be, which is adding 50% more cost, 50% more environmental damage, which already isn't great. But why isn't everything set up properly, I hear you ask? Let me explain. <laughs> Most homeowners just want a boiler that works. They turn it on, the radiators get screaming hot, the house warms up, everyone's happy. Heating engineers, any heating engineers? No one is admitting to it not unreasonably want to turn up for a job, they want to put the boiler on the wall, they want to put the radiators up, they want to get paid and they just want to leave. What they don't want to do is come back to deal with irate customers unpaid. Again, not completely unreasonable. However, up until recently, last two, three years, what's always kind of been overlooked is the efficiency of the boiler how much gas it uses, you know, that's just been one of those things that nobody really talks about. And I would say, if I'm being completely cynical, that 12 easy monthly payments on your gas bill are a lot easier to swallow mentally than a 3,000 quid gas bill turning up in February, March time. So we end up with this crazy situation where you have a gas boiler that's probably way too big because the difference between a big high output boiler and a little low output boiler is practically zero. Genuinely speaking, I think on the, the boiler that I've got, the difference between the biggest version and the smallest version, and they're all exactly the same apart from the jets in them and some software, is about 100 quid. But you end up with radiators that are too small because little radiators are dirt cheap compared to big triple panel versions and they're much easier to fit because you can hold them with one hand and screw them to the wall whereas with a six foot wide triple panel version it takes three people to lift it onto the wall. So you end up with a too big a boiler, two smaller radiators which then need to run screaming hot to keep the house warm which is easy when you've got a whacking great big boiler and it's the efficiency that suffers. You're using way, way more gas than you need to be. And that's why Martin Lewis says, turn down the flow temperature. So the upsides, you can save 50% of your gas bill maybe. The potential downsides, of course, is if you're turning the temperature down, the radiators are gonna be that much cooler. So your house might take a little bit longer to heat up. Or if you live in a sieve, it might never heat up but that shouldn't stop you experimenting because the chances are you can save money. How warm your house is depends on a couple of things. How much heat you're pushing into it and how much heat is leaking out of it. 
So an old radiator using tons of gas with screaming hot radiators will keep pretty much any house warm apart from the huge amount of gas it's going to burn through. If you put less heat into a poorly sealed house, so you've got gaps around the doors, poorly fitting loft hatches, cracks in the walls, open chimneys, that kind of thing, or a poorly insulated house, so you've got single glazed windows or um, no cavity wall insulation, no loft insulation, that kind of thing, the heat can leak out quicker than you put in the heat into it which is going to keep the house cooler or colder depending on how much leaking is going on because <coughs> ideally this is what we're after a nicely sealed insulated house with a little bit of heat going into it and a little bit of heat leaking out of it because keeping a house warm in the UK isn't generally a problem with the heating system it's a problem with the house but luckily there are lots of things you can do cheaply with DIY So during the event, like many others, I had a bit of spare time on my hands, so I decided to do a few small energy improvements. Fixing drafts with uh, lots of mastic like this is dirt cheap, I think I used about 20 or 30 quids worth, and spent several rounds of an hour a time squirting sealant behind light switches which is where nobody thinks about most people just seal cracks and things around doors but you need to go into light switches um, uh, behind sockets around loft hatches patio doors even along skirting boards and underneath skirting boards if you look on this picture here where the arrow is there's normally a hole there where the cables go into the ceiling or into the floor void if you're on the ground floor and you do get little drafts coming out of there. You know, each individual draft isn't particularly big, but if you add up how many light switches you've got and how many sockets on outside walls, things like that, all these little tiny drafts end up being, in total, quite bad. Um, same again here. There's outside walls, or um, if you've got conduit or plasterboard walls, you need to fill all that stuff with mastic to stop the drafts. And also loft insulation, I fitted more loft insulation as it's dirt cheap, especially in the summer. You can even get free loft insulation from your energy supplier or with grants for various things that go round and round. Um, I've got three lots of it. There's one under the chipboard that you can see in the foreground. Then there's the first kind of yellowy layer which I put in about 15 years ago and then the top layer went in during lockdown. Um, the government recommends you should have 270 millimetres, which, if you ask a lot of other countries, is way too low. I've got about 400 mil now, pretty much where I can, and it does make a big difference. I also got a bit carried away <laughs> and uh, borrowed a thermal imaging camera to see what was going on around the house of which there weren't oh spiders <laughs> of which there weren't too many okay I got a lot carried away <laughs> and uh, I bought an industrial fan and mounted it into the front door I built a cardboard front door and mounted it into that so this industrial fan blows a lot of air into the house nearly demolishing the house it must be said because it's not unlike having an indoor tornado going off everything was flying everywhere if you do this the trick is to open the back door first and then slowly shut it <laughs> something that didn't occur to me till afterwards so the, the industrial fan forces a lot of air into the house which then leaks out of anywhere where there's a crack so while the fan was on, I wandered around the house with a fog machine, turning the, <laughs> turning the house into a 90s rave, while, while the kids ran around outside looking for smoke leaking out of places. Uh, and strangely, yes, the neighbours did come round to ask what the hell was going on. So this is smoke leaking out of a uh, broken seal on the toilet window. Which, which, you couldn't, uh, which you couldn't see just from looking at it. It looked absolutely fine. 
Now, if you don't want to spring for industrial fans and uh, fog machines, which I can completely understand, you can buy incense sticks for a pound or so off eBay. And if you use three or four of them at a time on a cold, windy day and hold them around, around door frames and window seals and whatever, you can see the smoke that comes off them sort of waving around. It's very, very apparent. And that's dirt cheap and well worth doing. Just be careful when the ash drops off. Don't ask me how I know. <clears throat> right, this is a good point. Let me just rescale this a bit to discuss the should I leave my heating on all the time or just heat when I need it with a timer? Question that I've been asked quite a few times. Now, despite what anyone tells you, there's no right answer to that. I've heard various things on various TV shows and whatever going, oh, you should leave it on all day, or oh, God, no, you should, shouldn't leave it on all day. There is no right answer to that despite what anyone tells you. If your house is super well insulated and it's got no drafts or anything, then you may as well leave it on all day. The heating will leave you so little fuel, it won't matter. At the other end of the scale, if you live in a nice Victorian townhouse, which is more leaks than brickwork, then you're going to have to leave it on all day, otherwise you'll never get the house warm. But of course, then you're going to burn inordinate amounts of gas. So you may only be able to afford to have the heating on while people are in the house and awake. It's all a balancing act and don't let anyone tell you otherwise. Uh, <clears throat> pardon me. The other diversion I would say is that you really don't need to keep your house at 25 degrees C, like my sister does, because she, and I quote, feels the cold. Pardon? Yes. But you're jumping ahead of my notes. Stop it. I'd say that walking around the house in bare feet, shorts and a t-shirt is definitely a summer thing. If it's snowing outside, put on some jeans and a hoodie and even slippers. Turn the heating down to 20 degrees, even 19 degrees, and you'll feel exactly the same amount of warm and it will shave a thousand quid off your gas bill. So, with that out of the way, we really need to talk about data because you always need hard data. And this being EMF, there's no substitute for the facts. So, this is the connection from my Raspberry Pi, obviously, to the quite frankly dreadful Y Plan wiring which runs the central heating. This is so the Pi can turn the boiler on and off. And there's more connections to it here. Ah, I'll add right here if you don't know what you're doing or you're unsure of any of this, don't do this at home, because if you burn your house down or get electrocuted, don't come running to me. If you want to do this, hire an electrician, because they'll do the job properly and you'll be nice and safe. You've been warned. Right, the obligatory Raspberry Pi with the radio module attached to it. Some Arduino-powered battery power, battery power? No, Arduino-based battery-powered temperature sensors. These are connected to the flow and return pipes on the boiler, so I can see exactly what it's doing. Others are hidden around the house. Nice. Yeah. Uh, temperature and humidity sensors, more of them around the house. <coughs> Hardwired temperature sensors in the hallway and the landing, and more of them outside, watching the outside temperatures. Now I've got a hook into the octopus energy API, so I can see what's going on with the gas. And we need some software, the very wonderful Emon CMS project. Oh, Emon CMS from the Open Energy Project. And after quite some time tinkering, uh, collecting data, we get some lovely graphs. So this might take a bit of explaining, but there's lots of temperatures going along the bottom. The two humps that you can see are the flow temperature out of the boiler that we've been talking about that you need to turn down, and the purpley pinky one underneath it is the return temperature as it's going back to the boiler. So from this we can see how much the water has cooled down on a lap of the building. So they both start out at about 20 degrees C and at 7.30, no, 7 o'clock the heating comes on and it goes off at 8 o'clock. But by 7.30 you can already see the return temperatures hit 55 degrees C, which is what we're talking about, the latent heat of condensation. So by 55 degrees C, 
all the condensation stopped and you're running a non-condensing boiler. But by 7.20, it was already out of the useful condensation zone. So even though it ran for an hour, for 60, no, 66% of the time, there was no condensation happening, which is quite frankly rubbish. Here's another two hours of heating from 7 till 8 and 9.45 till 10.45. And in this case, things get even worse than on the, on the second lump of heating, the temperature rises even quicker and sits at the return, or the flow temperature, sorry, sit at 75 degrees C. And the return temperatures are over 60 degrees C. So it just goes to prove how rubbish it all is. This is the same graph, just stretched out a bit because we'll be using this scale from now on so you can see how things change. So this is the first attempt at lowering the flow temperature. You can see things have come down a bit, but barely. And this is even more tweaking. You can see there's multiple runs of the boiler going for an hour at a time with a little gap. But it's again climbing very rapidly because everything's warm. The radiators are warm. The boiler itself is warm. So the heat up is much better or worse, depending on how you look at it. So now we come to some real tinkering. The flow temperature on the boiler is set lower still. And you can see this is the, the green one. Yeah, the green one. That it's now pretty much staying below 50 degrees C. So you're getting some useful condensation going on in the boiler. But as it's running more and more, it, the return temperature is getting higher and higher and higher. So you're getting less and less condensa com yeah, condensation. More tinkering still more code but now we're starting to see some results here that the flow temperature is down to 60 degrees C and the return temperatures are down to below 50 and below 45 degrees C for much of the time so you get some useful condensation so the exact figures here are a bit hard to nail down but you're probably getting something like a 10% gas saving and probably even more like 15% depending on how you run it so this is a setup with lowered flow temperatures that you could do at home with a standard uh, heating controller. Or you could lower the flow temperature even a little more and run it for single periods as there's some worthwhile savings. But this being a EMF, we're going to push it just a little bit more. So the obvious thing is to run the boiler more, but for shorter periods. Uh, so this isn't something you could do with a normal heating controller, but as this is a Raspberry Pi, it's all node red all the way down. So it's watching the return temperature as a set point on it, and when it's getting too high, it automatically cuts the heating off so it doesn't escape the useful zone, and then it runs it again and again and again with a gap between the heating periods. But now we're getting zigzaggy bits pointed to by the arrows. This is the boiler itself deciding things are getting too hot because the boiler temperature has been turned down a bit too low. Now this wouldn't be a problem if you were doing this at home on a normal central heating controller because it's just the boiler shutting down. But I wanted exact stats on how long the boiler was running for so I had to program that out. And this is more attempts at running that. It goes even more zigzaggy. But now this is much nicer the boiler's on for the whole heating period so it comes on stays on till the raspberry pi decides that it's going to turn it off and then there's a pause and it cycles it again and again and again and now with some hit fiddling of the code and spreading the heating periods out a bit more it's running much nicer and the temperatures are even lower the zigzags you get you can see on the green are actually uh, convection inside the water pipes above the boiler because the boiler's off by that point which is something I didn't realize was going on and for one more slide this is the last graph overlaid with the gas data from the octopus energy API if you look at the last arrow that's exampled or pointed at um, it ran for 27 minutes with a maximum return temperature of 47.9 degrees which is well inside that 55 degrees we started talking about it used just over six kilowatts of gas and lasted 27 minutes but the average return temperature was under 40 degrees c 
so the whole day used 57 kilowatt hours of gas and cost £2.60. Yay, data. <laughs> so, what did I learn? It's complicated. There's an awful lot going on in a heating system that I didn't appreciate when I started. Lowering the flow temperature really does work and really does save you gas and save you money. But obviously, the more insulation you've got, the more filling cracks in, the better that will be because you'll need to run less heating. For my house, my boiler really sucks. <laughs> my heater, oh, yeah, the boiler is way too big, the radiators are way too small, and it's just crazily inefficient, which I, what I suspect most people's systems are here. First thing I learned was you really need to keep par paracetamol handy because all this stuff, the more you look at it, the bigger a headache you get. But the headline results are a 23% saving in gas for me, more consistent temperatures around the house, and also an incredible feeling of smugness. <laughs> but, but that's not the whole picture. Last winter, the house used 6,900 kilowatt hours of gas, a saving of 2,100 kilowatt hours of gas from the previous winter. On my gas tar tariff, that was a saving of 100 pounds, which doesn't sound much, but the flip side is my gas bill was only 350 pounds last year. But this is the real punchline, that this is the official off-gem chart, which makes my 6,900 kilowatt hours the low side of low usage. So what, I've got a one bedroom flat, who cares? Well, no, it's a mid-sized four bed house, similar to millions of others in the UK, built by a bulk builder, nothing special at all. So the real headline is for a little work, you know, you could probably get your house heated for 350 pounds during the winter as well. And we do run our house a bit cooler in the mornings, but you know, even adding more in the bit more heat wouldn't change that 350 pounds too much but the ultimate end game well it's almost certainly a heat pump pretty much for everyone here how much we like it or not but why a heat pump I hear you ask why a heat pump? with a gas boiler if we go back to the efficiency figures if you put a hundred kilowatt hours of gas into it and it's running super efficiently you'll get 90 kilowatt hours of heat into your house if it's running like most of them here, I suspect, you put 100 kilowatt hours of gas and you're gonna get 60 kilowatt hours of heat into the house, which is still rubbish. With a heat pump, if you put 100 kilowatts of electricity into the heat pump, it sucks heat in from outside. Yes, even in sub-zero temperatures. So you could get anything up to 450 kilowatts of heat into your house, which if you compare it with the 60 or even the 90 is way, way better over the whole of the winter, even taking into account deepest, darkest you know, January, February, where it's sub-zero outside, you'll probably still average 100 kilowatt hours in and 300 kilowatt hours out, because they've been using these things in Norway for decades and they do work. So I hope I've enlightened you all a little. Please share the facts and figures to everyone else that you see, because we're using too much gas and it's not good for the planet. I don't think we've got time to take questions now, but I'll be in the bar for a well-earned drink. So if anybody wants to ask any questions or you want to argue with me, I'm good for that. I'll see you in the bar. Thank you very much for coming.